Bienvenidos a Desde Cero. Welcome to Right From The Start. Uh, today's guest, we have Barbie Borek. How are you doing, Barbie? I'm good. How are you? Well, first, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and talking about the story of Trey. And hopefully it will help other other parents that are going through a, a similar situation. Absolutely. So I want to thank you for being on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, let's talk about, let's go right into it. And, and let's, and let's talk about Trey. Okay. Tell me about Trey and uh, his, his childhood. Oh my gosh, Trey. He was a hot mess. I always said like Dylan came right after Trey and Dylan's been my more calm, chill kid. And I always said, God gave me Dylan because he knew Trey would be a handful. Right. <laughs> and he was right from the start. You know, he was, I, he, I remember when the boys were little, they were, we had a two story home at the time. And they were upstairs, and all of a sudden, I hear this glass shatter. And McKaylin was probably about two months old. So I put the baby down and I run upstairs, and the boys are both standing there like, statues and I see the windows broken I was like what happened and Trey goes mom mom this crazy bird <laughs> and he's flapping his arms and inner like reacting how this crazy bird just flew into the window and broke the window <laughs> and I walk over and I said Trey babe explain something to me and I know you're too young to understand this, so I'm going to give you a little lesson. If the glass breaks from the outside, the glass would be on the inside. But if it breaks from the inside, the glass would be on the outside, on the ground, like it is right now. And I see you have a toy out there. And all of a sudden, Dylan just breaks down. Mom, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Trey threw the airplane at me and I ducked and it broke the window. And Trey looked over at him and he goes, really? You couldn't just stick with it? <laughs> and he was no older than four when this yeah. happened. And I was like, oh, man, I, I'm in for a ride. Right. But from day one, he was a mama's boy. Right. He loved his daddy. You know, he was his daddy's pride and joy. You know, but... Right. And, he wanted mama. Right. And and we met Trey through uh, our son, Alex. Yes. And they played baseball together with yes. the Storm. And, and your husband, Dennis, mm -hmm. Trey's father, he, he was his coach. Yes. And Alex always said that he always had a good time with, with Dennis and the Storm. Oh, well, so, I, we and, appreciate that. Right. We loved we and, loved uh, it. And, you know, Trey would always uh, talk to Alex a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and they would always play around. And, and, always, and he was always happy. Yeah. So you know, when I found out that that, that Trey committed suicide, it kind of, it kind of, I, I kind of felt it. Yeah. You know, I think a lot. I don't. I didn't realize at the time how many people were impacted. Right. You know, um, Trey's girlfriend, or we should say late girlfriend Emily, she will go to Harry's. You know, the local bar in town with some friends and. She said, Barbie, I cannot walk in there any day and not see at least one person with a Trey T-shirt on. Mm -hmm. And she's like, he's everywhere. Right. And that was Trey. He was bigger. He was larger than life. He was bigger than anything. Right. But his personality where it was so big, so large, shined so bright, he never allowed himself to outshine another. He would... Always take the time to pat a teammate on the back. Right. And he was his happiest when he was on a field. Baseball, football, didn't matter. Right. And baseball was the love of his life. Football came in a close second. Right. What's your favorite memory of Trey? <laughs> um, actually, it was the very last baseball game I got to watch him play. And... Honestly, I, if I would have known that was the last, I think I would have put so much more of myself into, like, being there, just being in that moment. Does that make sense? Right. But he had gotten asked, Navasota baseball team has a summer ball program. Uh, the high school kids are not required to play on the team. But, if you know, it's just a way to kind of keep sharp. It's not necessarily select. It's not necessarily 
UIL sanctioned. It's just a way these kids can still play ball and keep their skills building. Right. And so the team they were playing was being coached by a kid that had just graduated, actually. And, I mean, they're all talking smack back and forth. You know how baseball games are. Like, these kids probably talk more smack to each other. Yeah, than, I've heard them all. <laughs> yes. And Trey's sitting on a bucket, but he has a teammate sitting under. So he's sitting on his teammate's lap, and they're on a bucket. And they're smack talking back and forth. And then he tells the pitcher, he's like, hey, hey. Your daddy wants you and points to the kid that's coaching that just graduated. He's like, hey, daddy said don't throw a curve. Daddy wants you. And the last, he scored the last run when they won the game. And it was actually, you know, he he hit it. He hit a home run and they were, the bases were loaded. And as he's coming into home, he's got his arms out like an airplane. And just flies in and slides and stands up and goes, that's game. <laughs> and, but he never, even though he was a conceited, loved himself a lot, like a lot, a lot. He mm. really loved himself. He never let it go to his head to the point he wouldn't go shake the hand of the other team. Right. He wouldn't tell a umpire or a ref at a football game, hey, thank you for your time. He could be mad as all get out. And you I you know, like there were times they lost that that boy was hot. He was ticked. He felt like it was a bad call or whatever. But he never took that out on others or allowed himself not to be respectful. Mm. And that was something I noticed in him at a young age. It was not something that... Dennis or myself said, hey, you better do this. He did this on his own. And I was so proud of him for that because I I thought you're showing you're showing respect, kindness. Yes. And a lot of people, respect and manners are lost in this world. You don't hear kids say yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am, very often. And so the fact that he took some values that you and I were raised with, mm -hmm. and he incorporated them and made them more modern with, you know, dab me up or whatever, right. you know. <laughs> he he never made somebody else feel small so he could feel larger. When did you start noticing the change in Trey? Um, that's hard because... Dennis and I didn't let the kids start dating until a certain age. And so homecoming, his freshman year, he had to go with a friend. It could be a girl, but it was a friend. So he went with one of his best friends since a young age to homecoming. Uh, but when the year was coming close to the end, there was this girl he really liked. And Dennis and I had always said 16, 16, that's the age. But we caved because he he really liked this girl. But we said, you know, no hanging out alone. You're not going anywhere. Obviously, you can't drive. So she was always at our house. I mean, she was there morning, noon, and night. Like, there were times I was like, okay, I'm about to pass out. I'm so tired. Got to go. Yeah. Like, bye bye <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, she started bringing other friends around with her. Uh, there were guys. And I, I remember this one kid, he would not look me in the eye. He would pull up to the house because he had his license and would honk and not get out. And I just thought, something's off. Mm -hmm. Like, if you can't even look me in the eye, something's off, right? Well, her and this kid, they were good friends. And listen, I, I have guy friends. I, I'm a married woman, but I have friends that are male. That doesn't mean anything's up, right? right. So Trey, he, he was cool with it. He rolled with it, right? And then um, Dennis and him had gone to a baseball tournament 
that was really far out. So I had stayed home because I didn't want to have our little out that late. And they were driving back. And to get to our house, you had to cut, you know, you could cut through the neighborhood she lived in to get to our house a little quicker. I mean, it probably shaves off like half a second. But there's a stop sign right in front of her house. And they see her coming out of her window. It's like sneaking out, dressed very scandalous. I mean, scandalous. And climbing up in the truck with that guy. And that night, you know, I could tell something was off with Trey. But I thought maybe he was just tired. It was a long day. He played hard. And so we all went to bed. And then my phone starts blowing up at like 2.30 in the morning. I didn't recognize the numbers that were calling. So I thought maybe somebody was drunk dialing me by accident. Mm-hmm. And um, they didn't stop calling. So finally I answered it. And it with, on a voice on the other line said, this is officer so-and-so with CSPD. We have been told that someone in this home is committing suicide. You need to let us in. So I immediately go into panic mode. And I'm like checking all the kids' rooms, flipping on lights. I mean, our youngest was still a baby, you know, and uh, I woke her up I, like I was checking on everybody, and Trey seemed fine. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden the EMTs are are checking him and the cop is shutting the door and so they, all, they all showed up at your door yes and they, mind you we knew nothing there, like there were no signs there was there. nothing we went from the happy-go-lucky little smack talker on the baseball field couldn't pass a mirror and not say oh i hot um to uh, committing suicide like what the heck just happened in three hours, right? right? And all of a sudden, the cop comes out, and he said, look, he he took over 30 ibuprofen at least. Y'all might want to let him go to the hospital and get checked out or have him seen by his doctor tomorrow. He seems fine right now, but I don't know long-term damage. Right. What could happen? You know, his blood pressure was a little elevated, uh, hit, but his pulse was weak, so it kind of threw everyone off on it. And so we went ahead and we we saw a doctor, and he was fine. They said actually, there he needed to avoid taking ibuprofen for the rest of time because mm-hmm. it had done some damage to his kidneys. Do you know if that was the first time that he made an attempt? Yes. Now, I had I found out since uh, about seventh and eighth grade, he had been texting a friend saying like he was sad that day about something. Mm. Like I mean, it was something ridiculous. Like we wouldn't let him buy a game on Xbox or something, and. He would text a friend saying something like, I want to die, but never actually went through with it. Right. Well, come to find out, uh, we had had him sent to a hospital, an inpatient facility, after the first attempt. And we find out that his girlfriend, this one dressed very scandalous that night, had gotten into the truck with the boy. And all of a sudden, they're sending Trey photos of what they're doing that would be considered like child pornography almost. Mm-hmm. And obviously, she was cheating, right? right? Like, and so Trey, he took it hard. That was his first girlfriend. He thought right. he was in love, like, and he he tried to kill himself what what kind of help did he get after the first attempt so he went into an inpatient facility all the way in austin texas because even though college station has a deal in college a junior college multiple high schools multiple middle schools you name it brian college station has no inpatient facility 
we have one child psychologist in this town. Like, what? One? You know, A&M has started a awesome program called T-Chat, which gives kids the opportunity to chat with the therapist, but I think they only get like four sessions. And then after that, it's up to the parents to find out, find help. Well, my son died two years ago on December 12th. And my three children and my husband are still on a wait list to be seen by a therapist. Like, that's insane to me. How, how in the world can you be on a wait list right. for over two years after you've experienced that type of trauma? And that is, that's trauma. Yes. At its greatest level. Because mm. they, the night he died, all three of my other children, they saw everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. They saw their brother's lifeless body laying in the ground as multiple CSPD officers walk around chatting it up like it's coffee hour. Right. And then interrogating my husband and I and going through our house and treating us like we're criminals because Trey had stolen my husband's gun. It, we have a gun safe. You know, he, he just, he was almost 18 at this point. So if Dennis was working out of town or and it was overnight, he was the man of the house, so to speak. He knew about gun safety. He had shot guns. We used to live in the country for cross sakes. Of course he knew how to do this stuff, right? Right. But um, we never in a million years considered he would do something like that. Does that make sense? Yes. And come... So he had he got a therapist after the first time that he talked to you twice a month. Right. Um now this therapist was located out of Temple. So all meetings were done virtually. They never met in person. Right. Did you notice that he would get better? He would for especially baseball season. <laughs> uh and but after the girl was fully out of our lives. You know, she would show up at my house at 9.30 in the morning dressed like she was about to hit the club and just walk in. I remember being in my pajamas, standing in the kitchen, having coffee with a friend that had stopped by. And this girl just walks in through our garage door. And I'm like, um... Why are you here? Like, well, I knew Trey had a baseball tournament this weekend, so I wanted to talk to him and see how he how he did. And then about 30 minutes later, my daughter, McKayla, comes out and goes, Mom, you got to make her go. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Like, really weird. She's on her knees crying, begging Trey to get back with her. So, I mean, and I would get text after text from her telling me, how hard it is to see him happy with his new girlfriend and all this stuff. Why do I love him so much? I mean, it, it was a little extreme. Would, would that make Trey uh, depressed? When she would show up, it would give him anxiety. And then when she would start texting him things like, a life without you can't happen. I'm just going to kill myself sending photos of her, of a knife next to her wrist. Mm. Um, Sorry about that. That's I didn't right. turn that off. Uh, but do y'all want me to? Yeah, you can go ahead okay, and grab sorry. it. Um, I'm probably just a friend. <laughs> yeah, usually we say answer it, see who it is. But <laughs> yeah, no. It's a different podcast. Uh, yeah, no. Hey, next time we want to hit one of those funny <laughs> ones, let me know. Because, yeah. uh, like, we can do, like, I have people we could prank call till the cows <laughs> come home. But, mm. did Did he, did Trey ever come to you after that? No. And uh, tell you again that he, he had suicidal thoughts? No. In fact, like, when I would try to talk to him about this, um, any of it. He would shut down. I mean, it would. It's he would stick AirPods in and crank up like angry rock music, 
like that was his way of telling me, mm-hmm. shut up, stop. I want to, and he would get very uncomfortable. He'd be like, mom, mom, stop. And so I am, um, you know, I had, I just, I didn't know what to do. Uh, there's no guidebook on being a parent. Right. And there's certainly no guidebook on dealing with a kid who is so, he's he looked like he was carrying the weight of the world on him. And he wouldn't talk to us. And he'd be on the, you know, he'd have, have the virtual meetings with his doctor. In fact, the day he killed himself, he had a virtual meeting. Um, and it would start out, hey, doc, what's up? Doing great. Yeah, I'm doing great, man. He never shared his burden. The only person who knew truly what he was dealing with, how heavy it was, was his girlfriend, Emily, and two of his best guy friends. But as things got worse, he started pushing people away. I mean, he tried to push Emily away. Multiple times. I mean, he put that poor girl, like, God bless her. Like, she has the heart of an angel because she wouldn't back down. She was like, no. You can throw your fit. You can have your moment, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. And I, I remember thinking back then, and even now to this day I do, thinking, wow, how heavy for somebody of her age, but how grown of her to stand by him and stay with him. Right. I I believe to this day, honestly, she if Trey would still was still with us, she would have ended up being my daughter in law. Like she call she calls us her in laws. Like right. um, when <clears throat> we lost Trey. It felt like I lost two kids because Emily used to be at the house all the time. And then she wasn't. You know, she was like one of my own. And it's hard for her to come back to the house. And I understand that. I do. Now, she'll meet us out and about, but she she comes by rarely because it's hard. And... Heck, I'm not going to lie, staying in the same home is hard. But leaving it would be even harder for us because it would feel like we're leaving him. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the world, it seems a little darker, a little heavier without him. He had a way of making you laugh. And he would, you know... My husband, Dennis, says all the time, what I miss the most is the little the little digs, the back and forth that him and I had. Right. And they did. I miss getting, every time I heard the word mama, I knew he was going to ask for something. You know, if he was going to tell me something, it was ma, mama. Mm-hmm. But when it would go mama, I knew he was he was coming to me for money or <laughs> something. I remember one time being so sick, and a friend of mine who's actually a nurse had called to check in on me. And I'm on the phone with her, and Troy comes out, and he goes, Mama, will you make me a toasty? Which is a, a more upgraded type of, you know, grilled cheese. Mm-hmm. And my girlfriend on the phone goes, really, Barbie? Really? He's almost 18 years old. Tell that boy to make his own dang toasty. Like, and then she said, explain to me what a toasty is. <laughs> so, uh, what is a toasty? <laughs> it is basically, uh, you know, bread, you know, the bakery fresh, like sourdough bread Mm -hmm. with margarine and butter and 
three different types of cheeses that are grilled to perfection, <laughs> and it is nothing but calories and calories and calories. Like, it is the carb load of your life, <laughs> you know? Right. If you can't have dairy, don't eat a toasty. <laughs> All right. Let's uh let's talk a little bit about Trey's passing mm. without getting into you know details. Well, uh, let, let's let's look at it from your point of view. Uh, did you notice anything the night before, or any oh signs? God. I relive that, that day. That I, Talk to me about. I that relive day. that day every day in my head, thinking, did I, did I interact enough? Was that, did I seem like... Or did you miss something? Yes, like, or did he want to come to me and felt like he couldn't? Where where was the disconnect? I'm his mother. The buck stops with me. Right. I should have seen it, right? Um, but it was just, we had gone to San Antonio the weekend before. Uh, the Cougars had made it to a state playoff game. And even Football. though yes, and even though Trey was no longer with CSHS, our youngest son was and is in the varsity marching band, which you know he still is a part of. Like the Cougar marching band is probably one one awesome band, and I know nothing about marching band, but I've <laughs> learned a lot, and I will tell you. Their show this year, I literally got chills watching it a few Fridays ago. Uh, but, you know, we had gone to support our youngest son, Dylan. However, on the way to San Antonio, Trey starts having a panic attack about going to the game, about seeing people. Okay. Because— Revisiting the, yes, the old friends, right? Because CSHS, sadly— <sighs> where we went and begged and begged and begged them to protect him, to help us, to make this end. Sadly, we did not get the help we had needed. In fact, the baseball coach felt like Trey's mental health was a PR liability, so he removed Trey from the baseball team. When that happened, we had decided, okay, this this is not a safe space for mm -hmm. him, for Trey specifically. So we were, pulled Trey out of CSHS and homeschooled for a little bit before we had sent him to stay with my in-laws and attend Bremond ISD for his senior year. Sadly, fourth football game of the season, he ends up fracturing his T4 vertebrae and he's home because of physical therapy. And he's back in College Station doing homeschool. He's limited in mobility, which only added to the depression, I, mm -hmm. I truly believe. Uh, and he went through heck. I mean, a, a lot to get better. And finally, the doctor approved him to go back for baseball season. And he was so happy and so excited. He was ready to rock that field for his senior year. He was ready to show the world. Now, what month was this? Because he passed in December. Yes. So he got the okay to return and start training again. And right Right before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And so Thanksgiving for him, that was a celebration. Sadly, I had learned some news the day before Thanksgiving that I knew would rock his world. But I did not share it with him. Only because Dennis and I were waiting for our lawyer to confirm what I had heard. And so... You know, he, he was, we sat him down on December 10th, which was right, or no, I'm sorry. Uh, we sat him down on December 6th and told him what we knew. And 
his girlfriend was there, Emily was there, and I felt like, okay, that's someone he can lean on, something good, right? And they were watching a movie, and Dennis and I walked in, and we were like, look, hey, we need to talk to you guys. This affects you both, ultimately, because if Emily decided to stay with Trey, you know, it affected her too. And when we told him, there was no really shock and, oh, my gosh, there was no anger. He just shut down. He said, all right, can we stop talking about this? And he rolled over and turned his back to everybody. And Did, did you automatically feel something I felt very the, off? I felt the shift. I felt the change. Um, that's why I reached out to his therapist. I was like, look, we we need you right now, like right. right now, right now. And I had gotten him an appointment for December 12th. So on the way to San Antonio, he has a complete and total meltdown about going to the game. So Dennis and I said, look, you can hang out in the hotel room. Not a problem. And we still went to the game. Well, right before halftime, right before Dylan's big moment, right? His, Trey's girlfriend calls me and she goes, Barbie, Trey is sending me some texts that they scare me. I'm scared what he's going to do. And I said, screenshot and send them to me. And so I get them. I can see where they were alarming, but they were not. It wasn't, hey, I'm going to hurt myself. It was a photo of him with my husband's gun. And he's throwing a peace sign. And the gun's laying on his leg. Well, and pretty much playing, like playing with it. Yes. And he said to her, thank you for always being my ride or die. Mm -hmm. She said that. So I was like, ah, I think you're overreacting. Like, I feel like he's just trying to thug life, you know, play when even though he's the whitest white boy there ever was, he he wants to act like he's a thug or something. I don't know. Um, so I actually texted him, getting on to him. I was like, stop it. I don't know where you found this, but you need to put it up in a way. And don't you dare do anything because I just want you to imagine what that'd be like for your siblings, for your father and I to walk into a hotel room that you are shattered around. So stop it. Let Dylan have his moment. Stop taking it away. And he wrote back to me, Mom, do you know how hard this is on me? Watching you and dad pay all these people for me to defend me against a lie. Um, and the last text he sent me ever said, I'm sorry, I'm not the son you wanted. There was a lot of guilt. Yeah. And I'm mad at myself because I was so agitated in that moment. I should have written back, but you are, you are, you are my everything. Yeah. You complete me, but I just didn't reply. Do not ask me why I didn't reply. I don't, I don't know if it was because halftime show was starting. I don't know if it was because I was agitated. I don't, I, I don't know. And I'm, I, I will never forgive myself for that ever because that boy, he was the light of our lives. He yeah. he made us a family. I Dennis and I got pregnant so young with him. And when we decided we were going to step up and be his parents, he brought all of us together. He made us the Borax. Yeah. And then he's gone. And, but... Did he pass away at, at his home? Yeah, he... I think what it was is he wanted to still be close to home when it happened without disturbing necessarily everything for his siblings. So there is an open field behind our house. And 
we had our trampoline back there because our backyards are so small. I don't you know, college station subdivisions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was by the trampoline. And, uh, but in San Antonio, after I got on to him and all that, we get back to the room. He's dressed, ready to go to dinner. We are frantic, like going up and down the river walk at like 11 p.m. at night trying to find one restaurant open because I have starving children, right? Mm -hmm. And when we find this one restaurant that was still taking customers, and I'm telling you, the food was awful. But in, in that moment, we thought it was glorious. Like, that's how hungry we were. Looking back, I was like, oh, my God, why did we eat there? I think I saw roaches. Like, ew. (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, at a lot of these restaurants, especially in places like the Riverwalk or whatever, have somebody with a camera walking around to the tables. Can I take your photo? I, it, that's common. Right. And for some reason, I said yes. Don't. I don't know why. We were all exhausted and looked like roadkill. <laughs> but I said yes. hmm and that's the last family photo I have. Wow. That was taken 72 hours. Before his passing. Yeah. But that next day, because we stayed the night in San Antonio to kind of as a family come together. And he was amazing that weekend. He didn't complain. He didn't argue. He held his baby sister and walked up and down that river walk all weekend long, and never once did he complain. I wanted to take photos, and he was all about, yeah, guys, get in here. Come on. He spent time individually, one-on-one with his brother, one-on-one with each sister, with his father, with me. And... I thought, I even said to Dennis, I said, wow, look at this. Look what we did. Mm-hmm. He's, he's grown up. He's becoming a man. I was like, I, I took that moment to pat ourselves on the back, actually. And he, the whole ride back from San Antonio, you know, his little sister is getting cranky. It's a long ride. Hard on two-year-old, right? And, uh, you know, he's sitting there playing with her. Like, I have so many videos of him in the car with her or, you know, just going, oh, my gosh. Oh, where's Kenna? Mm -hmm. And he did that with a friend of mine's son. Like, our favorite video is, where's Odie? Like, um, (laughs) and he would just do this goofy voice and he would make them laugh. And, you know. When he was around the littles, he, especially the my youngest daughter, McKenna, when he was around anybody her age or her, you didn't think anything was going on. He had a great way of hiding it just to be there for these little kids. And he was the same way with helping out in the special education classroom or the special Olympics. He never took his problems into that situation. He didn't want to burden others. And that's what I loved about him. Uh, How grown, right? How grown up of him. But um, we get back from San Antonio. We're exhausted. My husband had to go to work that next day. But we had decided, look, it's already December 12th. Like, we're decorating the Christmas tree tonight. Like, this is happening. Mm -hmm. So Dennis gets home, and I had been lazy all day. Like, I'm not even going to lie. I was lazy. Like, traveling is no vacation when you're a parent, as you know. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, I Dennis was like, started unpacking the suitcase. And we had the gun that Trey had taken the photo with. And Dennis had an extra clip. Well, he had put the gun on top of the gun safe, went back to the suitcase across the room to get the extra clip to put it all up together in the safe. Um, As he's looking for it, Trey comes into my room. 
and which was not common because my kids know my room is my place. Like y'all have the whole house. Give me one room, please. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and he's asking for a boy, another boy that he knew to come over. And I was like, Trey, you know, we, we don't like him around. He openly like smokes drugs and does all this stuff and like shows up over here smelling like a weed factory. Like, no, you know this, like, why are you doing this? Why are you even asking us this? And he was like, well, you said I needed to be more social and you wanted me to start hanging out with my friends again. I'm trying to do that. And I said, we want you to hang out with friends that are a good influence on you, son. Like, this is what growing up is, yes. realizing who's good for you and who's bad. And all of a sudden, it wasn't done aggressively. It wasn't meant to be like, I'm hurting you. Right. You, you were being a parent. Yes. But he pushes me. Not not being like, I'm not saying like he was. He was violent. He was no, violent. it was not like that. Um, he was just trying to get past me. He pushes me out of the way, and he grabs the gun and takes off. Now, you've watched him play baseball. So, mm -hmm. you know, when that kid runs, well, he, he's running. There's no catching him. Right. Um, so I called my dentist, and I actually both went, oh, God, here we go. And so we both, we, we didn't feel an urgency we thought he was just being dramatic honestly mm -hmm. um and i had said did my husband did he take his medicine today and he goes and we i don't know and he goes in the room and we found two weeks worth of his medication hidden not taken that he hadn't taken then come to find out in a letter he wrote that the meds made him feel like he was, he had no emotion, none. Zombie. Yeah, he didn't, so he didn't like taking them. Uh, he just felt like he, he didn't want to interact with anyone. He just wanted to sleep. Like, so, I mean, his anxiety, his depression, it was on full blast. Then you add on top of it, I tell him this news that is pretty flipping heavy and he, so he takes off i call my neighbor and ask her hey look we do not want cspd involved because it just causes nothing but more drama for the parent if you think about it you're the one paying the courts the lawyers all of this like it's just it's not worth calling them like is how we feel others might disagree but i'm the parent that does not feel like I need to call the cops to be a parent. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. So she comes over. Her kids are in my living room with my other children. And she, I was like, well, I'm going to start walking toward the high school because I thought he went to the baseball field. And she said, okay, I'll pick you up. So he took the gun and, and y'all didn't see him after that? Mm-mm. And so, honestly, I thought he went to the baseball field. Mm -hmm. Like, that, that's his happy place. That's right. his safe place, right? And I, I'm walking toward it, wait, waiting for my friend to get me. And I get about four houses down, and I hear a pop. And I smell gunpowder. But I wouldn't let my brain go there. I, I wouldn't. My, I was like pushing, no, yeah. that did not happen. You were denying. Absolutely. And we get to the baseball field, and they had left, like, the equipment closet unlocked. And I'm not, like, I'm sorry to the coaches and the CSISD individuals, but, yes, I did rip everything out of that closet looking for him, trying to get to the very back to see if he's hiding in a corner that is dark or something. Did you feel that something had happened? I knew something was up, but I did not think— <sighs> I didn't think it was severe. I felt maybe medical attention would be needed, but not, not to, not to this degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going through that closet. And I'm sorry, and I get Take a phone. I get a phone call, and it's my neighbor's daughter. Actually, she's probably eight, 
at the time. And she said, Miss Barbie, Mr. Dennis said to get back and call 911. Now, my husband does not dial 911 unless it's an emergent, like a real really emergency. And I, I, I couldn't, I, I was like, a fr I was frozen in fear in that moment. And I'm just shaking. And my friend prays God for my neighbor and friend because she took over. Like, she called and she drove us back to the house and we're running through the house and we get to the back door. And she turns around and she goes, stop. I don't know what we're about to see. But I don't think as a mother you should see it. Stay here. I, I listened, and I see Dennis, and it looks like he's doing CPR. And I hear him yelling, son, breathe, just breathe, son. And I'm just standing there. I'm watching everything. It was like an out-of-body experience. Like I, I, I couldn't even think about, like, anything really like I, I felt like I was in a bad horror movie or something yeah. and then all of a sudden I see my husband just hold like holding him like cradling his head in his upper body and he starts rocking him and Meredith takes over my neighbor and she's yelling breathe Trey breathe and then she just starts holding him. And Dennis gets up, walks across the backyard to me, and goes, Baby, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, but he's gone. And I scream, No, and I drop to the ground. And then the rest, it's like everything on fast forward like yeah. you see in those movies. Yes. And you're just there. And that's how it felt. There had to be at least 70 to 80 police officers, EMS, fire trucks. Like, I mean, it was, I guess, essentially a crime scene. Yeah. But it looked like something you would see on some Law & Order show or something. And... I remember this one cop, I guess he was like the head, and he came over to us and he said, you know, we have to wait for a justice of the peace to come and pronounce it. So he wasn't taken to the hospital? No, he was left in the dirt and the grass. And they wouldn't let us pass a certain point. They wouldn't cover his body. So every underage child in my home saw the life of the party, so to speak, lifeless body laying in the dirt. And I screamed at that cop. I said, no. And I'm using profanity and everything. And I'm like, you do something. You do your job. This is what all of y'all are for. This is what my tax dollars pay for. And I lunge at him. And I don't know what I would have done or what was in my head that I could accomplish in that moment. Mm -hmm. And my husband comes around my waist and pulls me back. And the police officer said to him, I could arrest her, but I'm not going to. But keep her calm. Yeah. How? <laughs> we are, we're parents. Right. It, I guess there's something poetic to the thought process that I held that boy as he took his first breaths in this world. Mm -hmm. And my husband held him as he took his last. Nice. But... Um, how how did you cope the first couple of weeks after trespassing? Anger. anger. There was a angry? lot of anger. Um, my husband was broken and sad and 
crying and very emotional. And I felt like only one of us could do that at the time. How are you coping now? (sighs) Friends that have stood by us, which that group got very small, very fast. Yes. Now, the first few weeks, you've got everybody all over the place. You know, my house was packed with people. And I, my, the statement you hear the most is, I'm going to be here. I'm here if you need anything. I heard that a lot. <laughs> Man, they take yeah. off. Whoop. Like, well, I mean, scared rats. Yeah, the, the first couple of weeks, uh, after the first couple of weeks, everybody just leaves. Mm-hmm. And you're alone with your family. That's the worst. The, when everyone's gone. Right. That's the worst. Yes. Um, I. How are you coping now? But talking. Talking about it. Yes, talking about it. Fighting. At first, I I was on a mission to fight for justice. The kids that were right. that was the angry part. Yes, the kids that were bullying and ultimately terrorizing him, causing problems for him, and not only at school, not only on social media, but through the legal system, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, how in the world they, you know, kids can accomplish this is beyond me. But apparently, like, you know, you you can get on the internet, say anything about anyone, and boom, all of a sudden you've ruined somebody's life, and Mm -hmm. you don't have to take responsibility. That, to me, is insanity in its own mind. Right. Like, I'm sorry. You think about how many people a day you see that you might be in a room alone with. Okay. They might tell you something you don't like, Mm -hmm. you don't agree with. So, basically, you can get on any social media platform and say they were inappropriate with you. They touched you inappropriately. Or you could paint on bruises and say they attacked you. And all of a sudden, you've put someone's career, life, family, everything in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And the craziest thing is the legal system takes these Snapchats or tweets or Facebook posts or whatever and investigates. Mm-hmm. Like, seriously? <laughs> I Whatever happened if you investigate after a police report is filed, right? right? But now you're looking to social media to meet a quota? Come on. Right. That's how, insanity. How, how much do you think social media played a part? Social in- media was a 99% of this. A th- no, 100% of this. Like, 100%. honestly. Because if he wasn't seen, you know, all these posts, all these accusations, like there, there was a, a, a Snapchat, I believe, account made that was just non, like it was uh, saying, oh, you can give information and they will put it out there anonymously. And it was a legitimately a bashing my child page. Mm-hmm. That was it. Like, just attacking him nonstop. Uh, he was walking down the halls at school before we pulled him out of class at CSHS. And having the most horrendous name-calling being yelled at him across the hallway. Teachers, coaches, administrators heard all of this i thought i was friends with some of these people and Mm -hmm. you can't even text me you can't tell me what's going on i find out essentially what's going on after it has blown up to the point that the cops are involved that's when i find out what's going on Mm -hmm. because my son felt he could handle it no, you go to your mama and you let mama handle this because this is grown people business at this point. Yeah. What would you advise someone who's going through this? What would you advise parents that are going through this right now? You're not alone. Don't think you're alone. Do not try to handle this by yourself. 
talk to others. I the hardest part for Dennis and I was feeling like, uh, what if this person doesn't know? And then we tell them and then they're questioning or they think we are contagious because heaven forbid somebody has says the words mental health to another individual because all of a sudden it gets turned into, oh, I'm not touching that. It's, it's like AIDS was in the 80s. It's taboo. We don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. September, we are in September right now, is National Mental Health and Suicide Awareness Month and prevention, or basically, jet, and that you're supposed to wear purple and teal. Uh, tell me how many schools, football games, bands, what cheer, whatever, do you see honoring that in the month of September? Have you ever seen it? No. Now, think about October. You see pink for breast cancer awareness and prevention and all that, right? Mm-hmm. All over the place. NFL, collegiate. MLB, everybody has pink Every bats. And yes, I mean, <laughs> like, literally, I, all these different sports equipment manufacturers have made millions off of making a pink wristband, right? Mm -hmm. But purple and teal, it's not touched. And mental health touches our kids in a big way. And I am not at all downplaying breast cancer. I, please do not, I do not want any listeners right. thinking I don't, that. I don't think that's your, yeah, no, that's your intention. I, my intention here is we need to let our kids know, like, just by the simple act of wearing a ribbon, think about it. We have all of a sudden opened a door for them to say, hey, this person is okay. They're not gonna judge me. Or think that I'm a weirdo or something mm -hmm. if I talk to them about some depression I'm dealing with or some anxiety that's happening at home or that I'm being bullied on social media. Mind you, every school has a cyberbullying policy in their student and parent handbooks. If they've been in there since, you know, basically kids could have a social media mm -hmm. and yet I, not one school enforces them not one i have i remember having meetings with the principal and assistant principal at the high school and i had printed it out and highlighted it and then put arrows pointing to their their policy mm -hmm. and then the law that came out a few years ago um, that it addresses this exact issue, and we're not following it at CSHS. ILT, I think, is the only school in Brazos Valley that really enforces a cyberbullying uh, policy, period. You know, the post that started all this horribleness that brought on the situational depression that Trey was dealing with, that brought out what I believe was bipolar in him, um, which bipolar doesn't normally show up in boys until their early 20s. Bipolar for women does not, it, bipolar one especially, doesn't show up until like late 20s, early 30s, but in men it shows up earlier. Uh, and I believe all of this kind of activated something that he it was already in his DNA. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. But the situational depression, which kids deal with that all, all throughout high school, I promise you, all throughout high school, college, middle school. My daughter had an 11-year-old friend that committed suicide a few years ago. 11 years old. Oh. 11. Like, at 11, I was debating if I was too old to play with Barbies. <laughs> I, I I sure as heck wasn't thinking. Uh, I mean, these kids are, they don't have a childhood anymore. Their childhoods have essentially been stolen through social media, sadly. Yes. I mean, it's the truth. Yep. They are now walking into, 
the hallways of their schools and feeling like they're walking into a war zone. Yeah. Where where do one go to get help? Well, sadly, in College Station, I, and that is something I'm pushing for hardcore, um, and I'm not going to stop. I'm very loud. I'm very annoying. And so pre-warning to it's coming. <laughs> CSISD, uh, City of College Station, City of Bryan, Bryan ISD, I am coming. I am gonna, loud. I am obnoxious. Let's make a change. Let's make some noise. Let's make it better. That is the whole intention of living on this earth, right? Yes. Make to make it better right. than it it was when we got here. Yes. You, do you want your life to be boring and like, oh, yeah, that guy, I, I remember him. Yeah, okay, whatever. Or do you want to be somebody who people remember? I'm Martin Luther King. Uh, all these people that are real, like, movers and shakers that have helped make America what it is, right? They started out just feeling trapped, feeling unheard, feeling unseen. Mm -hmm. What? And now we have schools filled with kids who feel the exact same way. They are trapped. Mm -hmm. They are unheard. And when our kids tell us, you don't get it, you don't understand. They are not lying. We don't get it. We do not understand. We didn't grow up with this. We, a rumor was started about you and you and I say, okay, it was bad. It was horrible. We wanted to hide under our covers and not go to school ever again, right? But after a few weeks, there was a new rumor out and the telephone game was being played <laughs> yeah. and it ended, right? Now it doesn't end. It never ends. It's on Social media. And it stays on there. And it stays on there because it keeps getting shared and screenshot and mm. reshared and reshared and texted and tweeted and then put on Snap and then put on Insta. And the next thing you know, our kids feel like the entire world, not just their friend group, no, the entire world mm -hmm. thinks XYZ about them or has seen a photo that's unflattering of them. Like, where do we as adults step in and say, that's enough? Oh, sorry. <laughs> my bad. That's enough. Yeah. We are going to we are going to make our kids stop being buttholes or we're going to stand up for our kids against the butthole. Mm -hmm. Where are the school administrators going to say, hey, no, we're not doing that. No, no, no. You know, when that post that started all this with Trey happened, the mom looked at us and said, I'm so sorry. She's a pathological liar. She, if it makes you feel better, Trey's like the sixth boy she's lied like this about. Mm. And I'm thinking, uh, no, not better. Doesn't make me feel better. Like, do something. I know that spanking is, like, taboo, but maybe we should bring it back. Because some kids are just out of control. Yeah. And I'm not saying my son was perfect. Trey was not perfect under any sense of the word. You knew him. I mean, come on. There were times you were probably thinking, ooh, you got, they need to spank that boy. Like, I mean, he, was, he had his moments. He backtalked. He snuck out. He broke her for you. He was not a perfect child. Mm -hmm. He was a handful. But he also didn't go out of his way to single an individual out to make them feel like the whole world was attacking them. Like, all of mental health, is it's a wide variety, okay? So if your child is diagnosed with dyslexia or dysgraphia, do you know that falls under the mental health like umbrella in our schools? So I, I promise you, every family out there, mental health has touched them. ADD, ADHD. I, it could be anything. 
And all of a sudden, your kid feels like they're different. Like they're not part of the norm. Because they have to get pulled out to get special help to learn to read. Or they have a special helper or get to go test in another location. This all of a sudden makes our kids targeted by the others who want to be bullies. And they get on their little bitty phones and they put up a post in the middle of the school day. And by the end of the school day, every school in a freaking 200 mile radius has somebody in it that's talking about it. Now, if it happens on the school property in those eight hours a day that we are entrusting our children to a school district, who's responsible? Is it them? Is it the parents that pay for the cell phone? Who do we hold responsible? At the end of the day, what was what that girl did was awful. Okay, we can all admit that Posting any lie about somebody online that hurts them is wrong, right? So, but she was a kid. And that is something I've come to the conclusion of recently. And it's hard for me to admit that, honestly, because I I want to be mad at her. Mm-hmm. But she was a kid, a stupid kid. Who didn't know any better. But uh, all the adults in this situation, including people at CSPD and the Brazos County DA's office, all the adults know better. Mm -hmm. So where do we step in and help? And here's the worst part. I believe if we all know what the problem is, but don't do anything to prevent it, to help stop it. We are feeding it. We are making the problem bigger. We're making it worse. And I'm sorry, but I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with being part of the problem. I want to help find a solution. And sadly, I can't fix depression. I cannot tell you exactly the moment it all, like, was he, did he, was he born with it? And, and it just triggered. I don't know. I, I, I don't know these things. You know, I always joke, I'm a student of life. Who needs a exact profession? Like, that's boring. Like, I'm a student of life. I want to yeah. learn. So yeah. I want to learn on this. Yeah. But how do we, we've got to start talking. Coping, that has been different across the board for every individual in my household. My husband. How's Dennis doing? Dennis, oh, God bless my husband. Dennis, he works. That's how he copes. He works. That way his brain is focused on something else. But then when he works seven days straight and then he works seven days, he gets seven days off. Mm -hmm. During those seven days off, he becomes like a cat on a hot tin roof, pacing constantly. He is constantly feeling pressure and stress. And it's made him, and now he's going through the angry phase. But he's angry at anybody and everybody. I mean, I've never heard this man yell at anyone, really. And one day he lost it, just lost it on someone at the pharmacy. Because they were taking forever. And he even caught himself after. And he was like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. He said, but I did do you a favor. Because if it. I would have sent my wife in here. She's she doesn't let up. (laughs) Well, Barbie, uh, again, I'm sorry for your loss. Oh, and we all felt it. And I wanted to give you guys this book. Uh, This is the book that I read when my two daughters passed away, and it helped me a lot. 
the day that that I heard that Trey passed away, this is I ran to get this book because I wanted to give this to you. Thank and you. And I think when he passed away, I, I asked for for your address because I was going to mail it to you. Mm-hmm. But I knew I was going to see you guys one day, and and I wanted to give you this book. And thank it's called you. Holding On to Hope, and and this helped me a lot. Well, thank with you. My, with my two daughters. So. Uh, we appreciate so I, that. I so hope much. you guys read it. And I hope you yes, enjoy it. Yes, and, and I and so. brought it with me. Um, I'll grab this bag well, in a very, very. Um, you can get up. The cable's long. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, I brought, and we are selling if anybody is interested, and Trey Borat shirts. Okay. As you see, Thank it you. has his baseball number on right. it. But I did bring multiple sizes for you and your family okay. so y'all can pick through. Right. And we have, I think, like 12 boxes of these at the <laughs> house. Uh, but I will say Dennis and I are here for any parent that needs to talk. Look us up on social media. Like, I mean, we will talk. And I think the way we get through this right. as parents is we need to stop acting like we're tough and we got this. I'm not tough. I don't got this. I am I am broken. I am shattered. Yes. But I'm still going. And that has been something that I've held on to. I also have realized we will never heal. This is not something we get over. There will forever be a hole in our hearts. Yeah. But we have to allow new growth to happen around it. We have to stop feeling frozen in this moment. This moment is it's so much bigger than us. But no parent needs to feel how we feel. We've all got to come together as adults and stand up. You know, my mama used to say, you stand for something or you fall for anything. Mm -hmm. So I am standing up for our kids, for adults who work in a profession where they're alone one-on-one with someone and might say something somebody doesn't like. It could happen to a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a police officer, in fact, I think it happens to police officers more often than not because nobody likes to be arrested, right? Mm-hmm. But um, I don't think that people should be allowed to get online and just say whatever they want. And I know that COVID, oof, that yeah. ramped it up and that made it 10 times worse, yeah. right? right? But COVID's over. And now I, I did read somewhere that is going to take our world at least 20 years to heal emotionally, mentally, from what COVID has done. And at first I laughed that off. But now I see how true it is. Mm -hmm. Because we, COVID instilled fear in Americans across the board. And then you added in where people were blaming other cultures for bringing this disease over, Mm -hmm. and which is so ridiculously untruth, right? But we, all of a sudden, I'm noticing we're going backwards in time. Like, as a history buff, I'm telling you, I'm seeing us go back. We are all of a sudden singling out groups of people because of race, religion, creed, whatever. Like, what in the world are we doing? Right. The free- freedom of speech is a great thing, right? But your speech should not be there to hurt another person. Um, words sometimes pack a harder punch than a broken nose from a fist. And we need to start teaching our kids that. That's where it starts. We teach our kids, be careful what you post. Mm -hmm. Because once it's out there, it's out there forever. (laughs) But what if that post was about you? Then what? Mm -hmm. And our kids, our kids, they don't know how to handle this. Mm. 
And as adults, do we know how to handle this? Like, come on. I don't think we do. No. That's why there's no laws about right. this, right? Right. But, no, we've got, for one, like, do not let up as a parent. If you know your kid needs help, don't right. let up. Don't, don't just. Don't stay silent. Yes. Don't just sit there and wait for the referral. No. Keep calling your doctor. Mm -hmm. Call other doctors. Call other cities. But also, like, band together. Let's band together and demand that our city start up an inpatient facility that offers outpatient services, mm -hmm. single therapy, group therapy. Um, there's an organization in town called NAMI, N-A-M-I, and it is strictly mental health. And Brian ISD has allowed them to have a program kind of like one of the clubs our schools have, right? Uh, they've allowed that to come in and it's, you know, been designed and approved by, th you know, licensed therapists. Mm -hmm. uh, but CSISD will not return the phone calls. Uh, my youngest son has tried to find a sponsor in his high school to start a club for kids who have lost siblings because he wants to talk. He's hurting. Right. He just turned 18. And the night of his 18th birthday, he looked around and he saw Trey's girlfriend, Trey's best friend since third grade. And he goes, Trey's not here, mama. It, it's not right. Mm -hmm. The next day, my husband, he's started running after Trey died. Like, I, I'm not a runner. If I'm running, I'm running from something. Mm -hmm. But I guess that essentially that's what he's doing. He is running from his pain. Mm -hmm. And he ran all the way from our house to the gravesite. And he sat out there and he just cried. Because that a parent shouldn't bury their child. No. We shouldn't know what this feels like. And because it, we don't talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't have an open dialogue about, hey, my kid is struggling. What do I do? Um. Or we're afraid that people are going to start looking at us. We're like, ooh. Like, like we're voodoo. Yeah. Don't let your kid, <laughs> don't let your kid play with my, that kid. Yeah. That kid, he's got issues. Yeah. You know, yeah. these parents, like, it drives me nuts. Like, yeah. but we got to start talking about it. We've got to start respecting it. Like, if, you know, accept it like we've accepted breast cancer and how we want to beat it. Let's accept m mental health and how we want to let it know who's boss. All right. Well, Barbie, again, thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, uh, absolutely. Because we can thank talk about this me. all night. Oh, my God. I, I could talk <laughs> about Trey for days. <laughs> right. he, that kid was a force of nature. Right, right. Um, but, you so, know, the shirt sales are in hopes that one day we will have enough money to put a headstone out there. Okay. So... Trey's, Trey's grave has like a, a marker that a friend of ours, uh, they own mobile toys. Mm. They made a beautiful little marker to put out there. Is, is there somewhere that people can donate to, to the headstone? Uh, yes, we have, um, a bit, like we have my Venmo set up and that, okay. that we'll, is the savings. Uh, we'll, we'll try to put that on, on, on the, oh, on the absolutely. podcast and, and hopefully that everybody who's listening Donate uh, to Trade Headstone, and and again, uh, I hope you guys, uh, you know, fight and, and stay strong and, and stay in faith. Because I, I know how hard it is to lose a child, and and it's not easy, and it, it'll it, it'll get better, but it doesn't get easy. No, it doesn't. So, My husband you know, feels I'll, like he's stuck with bad luck, right. and, and, and I'll, I'll I'll keep praying for you guys, and and you. and you know, it, it'll get better. 
Thank you. It'll get better. And uh, everybody who's listening out there to Does It Settle, please subscribe and uh, keep watching. And, and please, uh, you know, if you need help, find help. Yes, fight right. for your kids. And there is always the suicide hotline number. And also, NAMI, look them up. They're on social media. They actually have an anonymous text line okay. set up with people who are being trained by licensed therapists to help okay. uh, right. our kids. Because yeah. sometimes our kids aren't suicidal yet, but we could be pushing them. Right. They could be being pushed in that Okay. You know, way. So, mm -hmm. hey, like, seek seek out help. Talk. Seek help. Talk to people. Talk to your parents. Yes. Right? So, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, thank you guys, and thank you, Barbie. Thank you for having uh, say me. Say hi to Dennis for me. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I'm sure he's watching. We'll see you all next Make time. Make sure my daughter's in bed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Bye, guys.